Okay, good, I'm recording. Okay, so um, I was, uh, I'm gonna recap quickly. Uh, what I talked about is, uh, let me start with the environment as it was uh, in the 90s, first of all. Um, there was no music school. In fact, the first music school was created by uh, the same Heritage Brothers. It was at uh, what was called DB Studios in Kablonga. Right. Uh, it used to be not even DB Studios, actually. It was uh, a government institution that used to record. There is one, one studio. Mm. If you go somewhere around uh, Force Headquarters, there is somewhere where you see uh, an old camera, like maybe that you've been taking it off. There used to be studios there. Um, Zam, Zamcom or something like that. I think it's Zamcom. So they had a, a studio in Kablonga. So uh, the first music school was created by the, the one. It's called, it was called the Lusaka Music Academy at the time. That was in the 90s. So it was created by the Heritage Brothers. If we recap, the original Heritage Brothers was created by uh, a giant called uh, uh, John Mwesa. I'm sure you've heard of him. You. John yes. Mwesa. Yeah, he is. I worked with him. Uh, I was his research assistant. Uh, what, what we did a lot of research on uh, on Zambian music. We recorded, we notated stuff, and so on. So I was his assistant, and then we went to Kenya to uh, to some Adventist university there. So their kids, that generation, the Mesas and the Lupias, uh, the generation, are the ones who created the Heritage Brothers. If you if you Google on YouTube, you can even find the original Heritage Choir, it was called that. Day. So the Heritage Brothers, which emerged in the 90s, was a product of uh, like a child of the Heritage Choir. And it had been, um, I forgot the first name, but it was the older Rupia. It was the younger Rupia, which is Brian Rupia in South Africa now. There was Alex Mesa. And then there was a gentleman called Ricky. So the four of them formed the Heritage Quartet. So they were, their, their biggest market, as I said earlier, was uh, uh, the SDA uh, church movement because they were mostly SDA. Now, sometime in the mid 90s, or maybe 95, somewhere there. Um, a big Swedish uh, jazz player, uh, I think it's called Victor Nordin or something, came through and uh, they had been noted by some gentlemen who worked at uh, the Swedish embassy. So when they brought in the, the trombone player, they two were put together. At the concert at Interpretive Hotel, I remember it was spectacular because you had this gentleman with his jazz band. I remember there was a bass player, there was a drummer, there was a keyboardist. I mean, the trouble himself. So they performed some songs uh, at the continent where perfect PA, it was a spectacular concert, you know. So after that concert is when I became their, their, their official pianist and also used to arrange music for them. Then they were subsequently to leave to go to Sweden because uh, they were invited by uh, um, again, the same gentleman who is working for the Swedish embassy. Here. He invited him to Sweden so, because he was now running a, a welfare program, uh, which was run by the local council in uh, some uh, in Stockholm itself, uh, where it was the welfare center. I would call it like a, an adult training center. Like in the evening, if you want to do cookery, if you have to do karate, there's a gym and so on. So you had those uh, types of centers in Zambia. They were called. Uh, welfare centers in colonial days so it was something in those lines so we were then invited to sweden and worked as professional musicians and they were earning quite good money from performances they would perform at churches they would perform at uh, concert halls and so on so to me those are some of the early professional musicians who worked outside of zambia subsequently they came back to zambia because they had left their families they came back to Zambia and then uh, uh, Brian worked with me at international school where this is now 1997, we're assistant teachers. 
um, we got frustrated, of course, because you are qualified, and then, you know somebody else is brought from outside who is not as qualified as you, or they may be qualified but they don't have the skills, you know. So he got frustrated, and fortunately, he left to go to Botswana, and he was the first uh, music teacher that I know to work in a foreign country. He then invited Alex myself to work uh, for to work with uh, the. Uh, the mines. So the mines in Botswana is uh, there is a mine, and then uh, another town called Letaken. So Alex Moisa worked at the uh, Akesha School, which is in Joanne, and then Alex, uh, no, Brian Lukia worked at uh, Akesha. And then, um, I work at the sister school in uh, in Lekwakane, which is a mining town. So there were then the two that uh, uh, were to be the pioneers of us music teachers going outside the country, right? Subsequently, I was uh, connected by Alex Moisa to join him when he went to another school in the West where he so I joined. Um, and earlier, there is a gentleman called Sam. Mabo. Sam Mabo actually came to Botswana before I did. So we worked together at the American School. Frustration as usual. So he left and went to work for a school called Broadest in Botswana. So literally there was months between his going and my going. Years later, we organized for Simon Kalomo. Uh, and then there was another guy called John Jitambo. He, he was a trailblazer in his own right. So he organized for himself to work at uh, uh, School in Botswana. Uh, uh, so um, other people who I could talk about were Darius. Darius actually has been in Botswana for maybe for the entire family uh, for a longer time than I did. I think he went, he must have gone before Alex, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. But he did go and he worked at smaller schools and then ended up at Thornhill. So he also organized for his sister, Likezo. So at one time in Botswana, we had uh, Brian, Alex, Darius, God, Sam, myself, Likezo. And then there are two other Zambians who are working at the Lake Lakani School. Uh, so at one time, there were about 10 of us uh, music teachers in South Africa. So Brian then left to go to South Africa because uh, his wife got a job there, so he left. Hence, opening for others to come in. Uh, later, uh, uh, he worked for some school and now he's running his own music school and a very interesting program. So the environment in Zambia was such that having been myself a, a professional musician, I mean, uh, people like JK would never admit that JK actually used to sing in my band before he became famous. We used to play like Charisma. He was our vocalist, you know. We launched him. Yes, we launched him. The Sakala Brothers, I worked with all those guys. Now, having worked with uh, those guys, there's a, there's a guy I'll mention who was kind of influential to me uh, in getting into musician. Brian was very influential, but this gentleman I'll mention to you is uh, his uh, transition to the other side. His name is Brian Zani. Brian he was, uh, was not even a music teacher, but a storyteller. Um, he, he had his small Mamiba, he had some pianos, and he used to tour the States or Europe and share our culture, share our music um, in schools. He would go in and tour and work you know, in the schools and do whatever he did and then came back. So when I was working for the American School, this is around 1997, so um, after Brian Lupia left to go to Botswana, I left to go and work for the American School. I was 97. Um, while, while working there, he came in, Brian Zanji came in and did a, 
a workshop with the kids. And he was very inspired by him. So I talked to him uh, about what he was doing, how he was doing it. He explained it to me, how he made money, like a living out of it. He actually even had a cultural center somewhere around Nali. Right now, of course, you know, you, you, uh, that center is even closed. And, you know, I think we've been built over it. But he sponsored, uh, it was more or less like Kawacha, Kawacha Cultural Village, that kind of a setup where, yeah, every afternoon you would go there, you would find people dancing and so on, you know, but it was him keeping the culture alive. So he inspired me and I said, okay, so it is possible to work outside the country first and two, to use our own traditional musics you know, our well, classical music, I must say, let's not call it traditional, it's our own classical music, <laughs> you know, to tell our story. So I, I decided at that point that uh, I was not going to be a professional musician in the sense of uh, being a full-time performer. I decided that I was going to carry on teaching because with teaching, you you have certain guarantees, so to speak, of a, a salary, a job, and then the way teaching is structured is such that you uh, you have school holidays, and that gives you the freedom as an artist to do what you want. So it was just a perfect thing, you know. People don't know that I, I have a law degree, I have a marketing diploma. But I never really practiced those because I love music that much, you know. Yeah, so um, at that time, it was very difficult to earn money out of, uh, out of music. The whole structure of uh, being a professional pop musician, we were exploited, you know. Uh, Wonder Music was there. The promoters were there, but they would really exploit the musicians. They wouldn't pay the musicians their worth and so on, you know. So it, it was uh, very challenging to be a musician. In fact, uh, me and my band got lucky. In the same period, uh, 97 to 99, we got sponsored by USAID uh, to create music and we'll go to the States and perform and come back. Would uh, this Americans would send a group here, maybe a, a rapper or a country singer, and we'd do music together? So we'd go out to the States and they'll come to us. But that sponsorship dried up, and that really cemented in me that, okay, let me mix my career up, do become a teacher on one hand, and do the other professional stuff on the other hand. And of course, there was also the church, you know, the church was. Uh, provided a platform for us to perform, to sing, to do our music. Um, but also the church was an impediment in a lot of ways because uh, if you know your church history, you will realize that I was one of the first uh, musicians to be suspended because I went to South Africa. <laughs> yes, I was suspended because I went to South Africa to perform in a competition and I was told it was ungodly for you to do that, yes, 1995. Whoa! <laughs> the whole year, I was I was not allowed to play in the church. I was not allowed to play in a concert. And I went. I went to South Africa because I told them to say my uh, my music career is the same as that of a doctor or a uh, an accountant who is going to work in another country. I'm just going to another uh, to me in a competition. In fact, I might even win. In fact, that's how I actually got to study because I won a partial scholarship that allowed me to study by participating in a piano competition. It was the first uh, Pan-African piano competition. Then I uh, competed for a number of years, maybe two to three years in the UNISA uh, music uh, piano competition and several around South Africa. And I, I never really won, but, you know, uh, the, the one that I won, won me a partial, but the others, you know, the most I won was uh, the third runner up, you know, or you receive uh, the most improved pianist, uh, you know, you receive uh, like a 2000 rand. but in those days, it was a lot of money. <laughs> so Zambia was not conducive. The only way you could make a decent living was by becoming a teacher and you had to work in the international schools. So that's not me. 
transitioned into the international school, working for the American school, came back to international school, went to Belbab, went to Leeds, back to the American school, then moved to Botswana. From Botswana, I went to South Africa. I worked for a group of schools. Um, then I moved to the Seychelles. I worked for Yamaha Music there. And then now I'm in Sudan. Yeah, but I've also worked uh, in Kenya uh, for um, what do you call it? Kenya International School. Then also I've worked in Nigeria and Ghana. Though those were exchange programs between the American School of Lusaka and those schools there. So would exchange with the teachers for say about two months for art teachers or English teachers. And so I got to work there. So the reason I went through all the international schools was uh, to try and experience the different learning programs. You had the British uh, system, the, the, there was the American system, um, there was the IB system. So by going through the four schools, I realized that, okay, uh, I, I was preparing myself for a bigger move, which eventually happened when I moved to, to Botswana. So it was strategic. Throughout the 90s, we kept performing. We did mostly corporate gigs with my band uh, called uh, Four Piece, because there were four of us. The band, its original members were four, but uh, it grew. Sometimes we would be seven, sometimes we'd be eight. Um, but we used to perform for our corporates mostly because the money was more worth it. The working hours were better. Um, so your question was why are musicians leaving Zambia? Mostly the teachers have, uh, the good teachers have left. Um, musicians, uh, there are a few that are not mentioned that are out there. There's uh, Matthew Tembo, I think you know him, though I think he's back in Zambia now. There's yeah, Eugene. Like yes, you know him, yeah, yeah. He, again, he was somebody who I mentored and worked with him as well. There's uh, a gentleman called Eugene Mbassele as well, who is in the UK, he's a doctor there. Uh, there is... Uh, there used to be, there was a competition that took place, uh, which was South African, but was incorporated African uh, countries. There's a lady, I've just forgotten her name. I'll research it and, and give it to you. So she won the competition. It was a South African base, and she won a contract to work in theater in South Africa. And uh, she's one of those few. Others in the past are people like Anna Mwale, who went to Germany. Mario Mamba was also in Europe. There was a guy called Larry Maluma in Australia. Um, who else? There was uh, Ricky Dilonga, who went to, I think, Denmark. Uh, Mulemwa, who is also in Denmark. You know, So those are musicians who left. The reason they left is the infrastructure, particularly uh, the, the, the system in Kaunda's time was pretty good. It was pretty solid. There was uh, a company called Teal Record Company. So musicians would record at the famous DB Studios. I don't even know whether it's still there. It used to be in Piachacha Road. Um, they would record there and Teal would sell actual vinyl records, right? There was uh, along, I think, Katondo Street, there used to be a shop called the Lusaka Music Parlor, where you could buy music records, you know, of Zambian musicians. Kalindula, Walter Kaunda was very good at promoting those. So from record sales, musicians could make a living. From concerts, musicians could make a living. Also uh, patronage in, in terms that Kaunda himself would sponsor musicians to perform at independence uh, of state functions, let's say, and would pay them, you know. So the, the infrastructure until Kenneth Kaunda left power was somewhat supportive of musicians and music career. When we went into the you know that uh, 
uh, uh, late King Fred, Dr. Frederick Chilova dismantled everything that uh, Kenneth counted did. Even the good things were dismantled and removed, unfortunately. That's when we saw the, the big exodus you know, of uh, living in and looking out into the the ninth. <laughs> so again, so the that is a very good friend of mine, performed with him. He was the first to introduce like a family style of performance. You you still had guys like Patrick Chisendele, who was we used to call him the Michael Jackson of Zambia. Uh, but that is brought to Raga you know, uh, mixed it up with uh, guys like Mainza, uh, a guy called uh, Chomba, a guy called uh, um, These guys had mixed with uh, R &D. Now we're talking about 94, 93, 94, 95, you know, and uh, so that was the birth of the modern dispensation of the music, and that's how Mondo music came in. Unfortunately, uh, music. Mondo music was instrumental, but in my opinion, was quite exploitative of the artists. He would buy the rights to the music, he would, they would record him, you know, right? But he wouldn't pay them their worth. A different kind of promoter came on because the music was only the only one. There was a white guy who recorded an album with by organizing so the movement then began to change uh, also the corporate world started uh, becoming more patriotic sponsoring more Zambia. it became better but it's still not ideal for me I wasn't believe it was another one I wanted to do, uh, I had always intentioned to travel around the world and work in different countries when the opportunity came I went to it. Two, the economic situation in Zambia. When the money was good, but when it was, it was very shaky. You know, Rupia Bata, Michael Sata, it, it wasn't very conducive. You know, um, it stabilized a little bit under Mwanawasa, but had that continued, maybe I wouldn't even have left. Um, staying in the in, in the school system for me gave you stuff. You know, I had a plan early. I needed to make sure that he's well looked after. So that's something that the schools provided in terms of uh, job security, good salary, um, was what we need to pay as a teacher. But eventually I did it because um, being a teacher, when you work in the diaspora, there is a difference. If I come back and work in Zambia, <laughs> I won't receive the benefits that I've received outside of the country. Let me just uh, give you an illustration of what I mean. So when you work outside on the past expertise, one, of course, you get the job. Two, you get given free accommodation. Some schools will give you a free car. Yes, depending on the schools. Uh, they'll give you free tuition for up to two kids. If you are single, if you are married, it's three kids. Free to you will get the uh, bonuses uh, as in gratuity. In most cases, it comes to 25%, but one it can be percent of your annual salary, right? Um, my salary in Botswana was uh, roughly thousand dollars. The tax rate is very low, so you, you paid about 18% tax. 
you have activation, you have equation, you have the gravity, you have the medical as well. Here, it means that you need for your for your uh, for your medical uh, expenses, right? So, at least the benefits are getting a good salary, accommodation, tuition, car, um, medical, and then. Uh, depending on the school, your most schools will have you travel back to your country every year. Some schools it's after every uh, after every contract, they'll pay like all expenses paid for every member of the family. The school I'm currently working for pays for you to travel every semester. So literally every month you can go back home. Yeah. Exactly, you and your whole family. You know, the salary, like where I am now, I'm very, very good. I want to tell you what uh, we're recording. I want to tell you what it is. I can tell you. Uh, it's, it's a good working environment, you know. Um, you get to explore the different countries. Like when I was in Botswana, I explored what Botswana was. When I was in South Africa, I explored what South Africa was. So I subsequently got to travel to Namibia, explored Swaziland, South Africa, and um, when I was in the big shows, I went to Madagascar, Mauritius, Reunion. Uh, now uh, in Sudan, uh, I'm going to Sudan for starters, but definitely the Middle East, I will explore. I'll explore it maybe from next year. It will go to Africa, where I will definitely explore it. So for me, being out of the country, part of the region is. Uh, the benefit that I get working as an expatriate, I would never get in Zambia. Because if I were to come back to Zambia, I would probably receive tuition, a good salary, and maybe go. Tuition for the three benefits, I lose all the others. So for me, it doesn't really make sense for me to be back home, right? Because uh, I, I for me, also professional development is a bigger reason because I get to put new schools on my CV. I get to experience, uh, uh, like I worked in IB schools, but how the IB is uh, interpreted in different schools is very different. Some schools have a very good uh, professional development uh, policy, which means you can get to study. As in my school, if it wasn't for COVID, they, we have uh, an allowance of $2,000 for per year for professional development. So which means I can go to any part of the world uh, as long as it's under the $2,000 or even if it goes above, if then I have to top up, you know. If it wasn't for COVID, I would uh, have uh, bettered myself uh, by attending workshops and courses, you know, so some those are the benefits. So musicians leave for professional reasons, professional development, they leave to explore, right? They leave for also economic reasons because you, in all honesty, you're looking for a better life, right? And every time I come back to Zambia, my my soul cries because of what the potential is, you know, where we could be, uh, music wise and so on. There's a lot to do, but the mindset is not there. The corporates right now. I'm, I'm trying to entice some corporates to uh, to to sponsor an orchestra. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get even six months funding, which would be great. Uh, we're trying to create programs that will promote music and musicians and so on. Uh, I would like to start a music school eventually, uh, maybe in the next two years or so. You know. Um, I've got friends that want to come and develop the music uh, uh, professional and so on. Um, but, you know, uh, we need to create uh, a platform and it takes time. Yeah. And unfortunately, musicians, we don't really work together in Zambia. Because I've tried to find people who can implement this. We, 
okay, issues of bread are important. Issues of uh, keeping our families are important. But I think a legacy is more important, right? Because we need that legacy that we will all benefit from it, you know? That's the current difficulty that I have. Uh, worthwhile, worthwhile and, you know, a legacy. Anyway, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Hey, thank you so much. I think this this really really gives me enough uh, you know, background and for how things things are moving in the country. I, for one, am um, somebody who's been seen how things are moving, and I'm not happy. What happened? I wish I could do something about it, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm still trying to get myself in the system. <laughs> yeah. True. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, um, we actually. Sorry, can I just recharge my my account? I've just one year. I'm low on data. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me just do a quick one. Sure, no problem. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording. Um, okay, okay. Okay, yeah, so um, I think it, it takes me back to, to the earlier discussion we had, uh, I think a few months ago. Uh, of what, what would we really call Zambian music? How, how is it? What's the perfect description of Zambian music? Who are we? Because what I see mostly uh, is uh, the music that we're doing right now, and it's the music that's selling more than the music that we write, it's more copied from other countries. Yet, uh, we have identity of those countries. Like if you hear something from South Africa, you're able to tell that this is pure South Africa. No, this is from Nigeria. But then as Zambians, what is our identity? Do, or, or do we have any? Um, definitely. You may not see this, or people might not. Uh, Agree with Zambia is when we go back into it, we realize that uh, Zambia is composed of a uh, settlement area of uh, tribes that traveled from uh, different parts of Africa. You know, there was uh, Lugalon Kingdom. Uh, the tribes traveled from local on the kingdom and settled. Some tribes settled further south and replaced the sun, and uh, then with the Benfica Wars and Shaka Zulu, you had uh, Sepitwani and his Makololo, the Ngoni settled in, uh, in the eastern part of Zambia, those were Zulus. The Swati, the Masop, what we call the, the Soto National, the Rotten National, the same tune. The same tune. So, what I'm talking here is I'm looking at the moving. came through to Zambia, so that's the Angolan influence. So you have these different musics that came with the people, right? So my broad definition of Zambian music is it's music by Zambians, full stop. But then to go further in that definition, okay? 
are we talking our own classical or for clarity i'll call it traditional or indigenous music then we're saying yes okay um we would call it indigenous music i, I like to accord our music the respect it deserves it's classical our own classical music so, music. let me take you to to jazz jazz is an interesting creature Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> jazz is like a, a mixed race child who is made up of Indian, black, white, Chinese, what, what, name it, and you have jazz. Okay. Yeah. The original, the initial music in the modern dispensation was a kind of jazz because it took characteristics from the different regions so actually the different regions of zambia have a particular identity for example sakala's brother's music when you hear it yeah. you know for sure it's from the east why because their music is informed by the traditional music of the eastern province when you hear lozi music there are two, uh, the proper Lozi music. You see, okay, let, let me give you uh, a further illustration. So you have the court musicians in at the Royal Court uh, in, in the, the Litunga. There are two, two orchestras. There is the Mbunda and there is the Lozi. You know which one is Mbunda and Lozi by the tuning on the xylophone, right? The Lozi one, the, the xylophones both have a triad three note triads. In the Lozi one, the three bass note triad is major. In the Mbunda one, it is minor. The rest of the notes are built up of a mixolydian scale, which is like a G to G, right? Yeah. The second thing that happens is the Mbunda, remember the Mambunda, they came and the choirs, they came from Angola, right? So they bring with them the richness of the rhythms of Angola. When you hear Lozi, pure Lozi music, it's not rhythmically as rich and polyphonic as the Mbunda music, right? So when you listen to music from Barotseland or Western Province, whatever you want to call it, you will distinguish that there are actually two musics there. There's the Lozi music and there's a, the Mbunda music. Now, the Mbunda and Koya tribes are also kind of related to the Northwestern uh, province tribes, right? The Luvale, the Gaon, yeah. especially the Luvale. There are direct links. So even Luvale music is actually quite rich, right? Um, when you go to the Northern parts of the country, there is what came to become Kalindula, right? That Kalindula is also informed by a particular style from the the uh, the what what do you call those the Bemba the Bemba. Lunda, Bemba Lunda you know tribes in that northern province the Oshi and all those right then of course you have uh, the Tonga and all the affiliate tribes the Ila the Lenje the Soli Lenge. yes all those central province Lusaka province you know uh, southern province their music also has got a particular distinctive flavor. Mostly, most of their music is made in a minor scale. They sing in a minor scale, right? And they, uh, it's polyphonic, but you know, also informed a little bit because the Tonga were the dominant tribe. But the Tonga, you, you will know, also cross into Zimbabwe, right? The river yeah. does not separate uh, the, the tribes, the Zambezi River. So you have Tongas in the Zimbabwe, Northern Zimbabwe, who also got some influence from the tribes in Zimbabwe. People think Zimbabwe has only two tribes, the Shona and the Yeah, they are different tribes. So there has been, like I, I've talked about jazz, jazz being a cross-pollination of uh, musics. Zambian music that started to emerge in the 40s as urbanization came was influenced by um, the music 
of the different tribes. Remember that in the 40s and 50s and maybe 30s, you had the development of the mines, right? The British were looking for labor. So they imposed a hard tax on the villagers and the poor villagers did not have money. They were forced to go to the mines and work. So as you go to the mines, you're bringing your own culture, your own this, your own that. So it became a melting pot, yeah? Very similar to, to, to jazz, you know, jazz, the slaves were only allowed one day to rest and do their own thing, which was Sunday. It was a place called Congo Square. Congo Square is where they came and brought their arms, their things and whatever. And that's how jazz became born. So our own Congo Square is the urban centers, you know, mostly the Copper Belt, Lusaka, yeah. you know, at a later stage, right? And then also with the coming of uh, modernization, uh, the coming of radio, uh, later, the coming of television opened us up to world music per se, right? Mostly uh, in the 40s, uh, jazz music or popular music from, from the States, you know, it permeated into, into our culture. That's how we then had bands and so on. If you listen to music, some music from, uh, from the 40s, it's very influenced by the jazz culture. Of, uh, of the United States, but they maintained some of the local influence. You know, I, I, could, I, I could play your music by uh, guys like Ali Kinkata, right? Uh, I have a piece on my phone. Let me see if I can play it quickly. It's a short one. Um, okay. Uh, Ali Kinkata. Okay, let me increase the volume. Young way, Okay, I'm gonna start it over. Okay. Okay, and I think my microphone is here. Also, you can hear that it's influenced by a, a bit of uh, church harmonies, local harmonies, church yeah, harmonies. Yeah. harmonies. There's a churchiness about it. So the church also influenced our music, right? Uh, with the coming of their harmonies, um, they, they were new to our ears, but we adapted them to what was familiar with us. I don't know if you, you, you realize what was happening. They started it here. 
then they would swap the accompaniment the tenor comes here then the soprano comes on top yeah going on top of each other you know but th that is to me more zambian than what we find in operation right now right yeah, like uh, popular music and so on there is yeah. uh, let me see if i can find another one by ali kinkata um this other one is that one is shorter okay this one i already played okay uh, let me find another one which will illustrate uh Okay, yeah. This is another one. Batila Selwali Lenkwale Linda Kwebe Umochilo Lele Kochilo Mendo Waluse Imirimo Listen to those harmonies. Minor. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Totally amazing. Yeah? Beautiful stuff. sweet right to the point you know this this to me is is more zambian music than what we have now i'm, I'm gonna uh while we talk i'm gonna try and find uh, a link there's a guy called uh hugh tracy hugh tracy is a big name in terms of uh african music uh, research you have to have him you have to know about him you know if you're you're doing this project so what he did is he literally went around uh, mostly southern africa um in the 30s 40s and recorded music in the villages so you have a bank of raw zambian music and that is what inspires my compositions i immense myself in those traditional musics whether they are from uh the east, the northwestern, western, uh, southern, northern, name it. It's, it's quite a substantial library. You know, sometimes you can access it, sometimes not. In fact, I'm, I'm just considering to pay for it so I can access all the, all the music. Although I know ZNBC have some, their transcription service have some, um, some recordings. So when i was answering the previous question i i referred to uh daddy zimas daddy zimas being uh him and mainza and mulwanda being the people who infused zambian music with r and b and raga okay it was good and bad at the same time right it was good because it it brought a new set of skills because r b had been around longer you know the vocalizations and so on brought that into yeah. into the music right but it did not marry it wasn't a very balanced marriage with zambian music per se when jk came out jk's music was zambian but heavily influenced by uh, uh, rumba, the rumba music of, 
of uh, Congo DR, right? I mean, having worked on uh, JK's first album, um, I can tell you this, that uh, uh, it, it was interesting. It was uh, like a, a song comes to, to mind. Right, so the, there was, JK was very clever in that he's, he's very creative, right? His vocals, like when we used to perform sometimes, we would just create a special section in a piece of music that we're doing for him to, to just improvise. So he's wow. got a, a pure ear for improvisation, right? And that has come into his music, okay? In the beginning, it was really, it was really good. You could identify, okay, uh, this is from this type or this is a Kalindula influence and so on. So if that culture that JK and the musicians at that time had introduced had continued, we will be talking a different Zambian music right now. Then the 2000s came and that's, you know, when I wasn't really in that sphere anymore. Um, when that era came, we, that's when I think we lost it. We allowed uh, popular music popularized by media, you know, MTV, Trace, uh, television and so on to infuse our musics. Because what is Nigerian music is a very ethnic sound. That sound that you hear that you affiliate with Nigerians, you know, the Kenyans have also adopted that into themselves. Those are traditional musics. If you go back to, to history, you have the high life music of, uh, of uh, uh, Ghana and Nigeria back in the 50s and 60s, right? We have Fela Kute. You've heard Fela Kute's music. You've heard uh, Manuj Bango's uh, music. May they rest in, uh, in peace. Those were very influenced by their own traditional music. So you had a traditional music and then they did not ignore Western influence, but they did not allow it to overshadow our own traditional music, you know? So Zambian music, okay, I'm going to say things that are going to be, make me hated. <laughs> has not been as intellectual as it could have been. We have gone with popular. We have gone with the neighbor is eating chicken. Therefore, I will also eat chicken. <laughs> That's what we've done, you know? Guys like me, unfortunately, are standing the sidelines because I have thrown, especially last year during a uh, COVID, I threw out a few orchestral arrangements of music that was done by Zambians from, uh, from um, the 80s, from the 90s. I, I threw in one of JK's pieces and so on and put them on social media and nobody commented anything. I wasn't worried, I wasn't uh, sad. I was just disappointed that uh, uh, people don't see what I was doing. I remember in one particular album, how not album, one or two recordings, I was explaining my music and I did a live, uh, very few people came and I wasn't really worried because I said, okay, I've put it out on, on social media. Um, some of the, the music that I, I have done, <laughs> arranged is influenced by Zambian music, traditional music um, and trying to capture the essence of what our rich music is, you know? So Zambian music, music is not static. That's why my, my definition was Zambian music is music done by musician, Zambian musicians, full stop. Then underneath there is, it depends, are we talking popular music? Are we talking in traditional indigenous or classical music? Are we talking uh, jazz, Zambian jazz as well, right? You know a band called Afro Red. Would you really? I've, I've heard of that. Yes. They're, yeah, they're, they're an amazing group. Their music, it's, it's jazz. 
by Zambians. But Zambians would not understand that music because it is world class, you know? It is world class. Now, there is, uh, you know Clark, obviously. There is one yes, yes. that he has done. I have a video of it. I'm sure you've seen it on social media as well, where he has this gentlemen playing African traditional instruments and then their saxophone. Yes. Now, that is Zambian music. Zambian jazz at its best. That we can package that and sell it to the world. I'm even getting goosebumps because I identify <laughs> with the, you know what is, Latin, what is Latin jazz? You know what Latin jazz is? What they yeah. do, they just did exactly that. They did not lose their rhythms. They just used Western instruments to bring their rhythms to life, right? Where you had a yeah. drum, they put the congas and the bongos. They had their original rhythms. Even the Latin drumming, the so-called Latin drumming. We had a project some years back where we were trying to notate uh, Zambian rhythms, and I still have a lot of them a lot of them in, uh, in my finale uh, folder. Zambian music rhythms. And I had started writing with a friend, but unfortunately he passed away. He's a drum. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So what we were doing was we were going to try and play on a Western drum kit those Zambian drums and name them and then say to people, okay, this is this particular rhythm. You know how you say you can say bossa nova or salsa or, you know, that's what we wanted to do. So we had no, I'd notated about maybe 20 to 25 different rhythm patterns. So basically, like in our traditional settings, you would have um, an ensemble. So the ensemble would have the different drums. You would have the master drum, you would have the... Yeah. The bass drum, you would have the guy who's playing the Galilo Boto or the high pitch thing. And all of that is kind of present on the drum kit, right? The Western drum kit. So the idea of that project was to try and play interpret that on this drum kit, right? To sort of modernize it, but keep the original thing, the original feel of the, the music. Because then, would have a bank that we can come to. Maybe I should uh, find another drama and, uh, and continue with that project, right? Another thing for me about uh, Zambian, what Zambian music is, is uh, I met a gentleman called uh, Lokwa Kanza and uh, Lokwa Kanza um, is born Congolese. He worked in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. He's now in France. He said something that influenced me big time. He says, our music should not be static. Whether we call it traditional or whatever, it should move. So yeah. how he writes his melodies, he, he allows his self-expression to expand the melodic sense while still maintaining the originality of it, he expands the bounds, okay? And I can send you a few links to some of his music, right? The call I really appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. The call and response is there. Whether, you know, like the, the music of Alin Kikata is also what we might call folk music. So we, we put a guitar under it and we, we do that. His music, Lokwa Kansas music, is also influenced by the folk culture. And one thing I can tell you about Loka Kanza is he never uses a Western drum kit. He always uses traditional uh, drum drums in his music. It could be maybe wow. the finger and whatever, but you'll never hear the, the actual um, drum kit. He never uses it because he says, well, I appreciate what the drum kit is, but it doesn't uh, pay homage to my culture and my instruments. So the music that is there right now, it's just imitation, you know, we're looking at what the Nigerians, what the South Africans are doing, uh, what the Congolese are doing, and we are we're not stopping our identity and our music. 
you know we are not we are uh let me let me try and uh, find a library no miss smithsonian let me try and find you the website then i can share my screen with you and then i can play you two or three patterns uh, so i can illustrate uh I can illustrate what I mean. Okay, and I think I found. Hopefully, this is it. I can quickly illustrate for you what uh, Zambian music, original Zambian music, folk music sounds like. You know. And see, okay, internet is kind of. Uh, what I'm talking about in terms of. Uh, okay, I'm failing to multitask. I'm failing to talk and type. <laughs> There, there have been musicians like uh, Lazarus Tembo. Have you heard of uh, Lazarus Tembo? I've heard of that name, but I, I don't think I've, I've listened to his music before. Okay, Lazarus Tembo has a very... Uh, interesting history. He... He... He, uh, he was born sighted became blind at some point okay i found exactly what i'm looking for and then uh, he learned to play the guitar uh, somewhere along as as his life progressed in fact he went to university with my late mom and they were very good friends because if my mom was approaching just by her footsteps you would tell ah miriam it's you you know <laughs> he rose to become the minister of uh, deputy minister of culture in the 1980s i think 86 i remember that and that's when my mom told me the story of how she went to university with him um in his travels he went and experienced an orchestra in the states there's a song called Z zinte um it starts very majestic he was trying to recreate what he had heard the symphony orchestra play it's uh, let, let me see if i can actually play it for you uh they're just the introduction um of this. it starts very majestic it's, uh, it goes like That's how it starts. It starts really huge and majestic. Then it goes, uh, the, the tune is. Very majestic. Uh, I'll send you a link. I'm sure the, 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 it's there on YouTube. Um, okay. He he did quite a lot for Zambian music, elevating it. He was a proper songwriter, influenced by folk, and so on. Okay. I have actually found the the correct website. Let me just see. Okay. If I can get the actual link. Um, let me, I'm just searching it. I know the name is going to be saying no harm.
Let me also see this other one here. I think this first one is better. Okay, my internet is slightly slow. So anyway, um, you 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 have um, there is a book that is on Google Books. Let me try and find it for you. The person who okay. who wrote it. Uh, okay, I'll send you the link just now. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you can read it um, online. It's uh, Google Books, let's see. Okay. Um, look at any English language you can find. And the book is called Zambian Book Legend, Zambian Music Legends. It's actually a, a good book for you to to read through because uh, a lot of what I've talked about is also articulated in in this uh, in this book. It's quite um, extensive in uh, in the research. I'm just gonna put it for you in the charts now, uh, or I can even email it later if you. You can't access the chat, but that is a book. It will talk about the development of music in Zambia and talk about the artists. It talks about women in music. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Then I'll show you what uh, share screen. Uh, Chrome. Okay, there we go. So this is the book. I'll just show you the, the, the table of contents. Can you see that the Genesis, great old folk, you know, men of guitar, and it, it talks about, see that, that's what I was talking about. The swinging 60s, you know, there was a rock influence, there was a jazz influence, the 70s, the disco, you know, Kalindula music, 80s reggae, women in music, you know, rumba, gospel, and so on, you know, so it's, it's quite, a, it's a very brief uh, discourse into Zambian music, but it will give you a, a good overview, you know, what I gave you is the 90s upwards. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this one will then go back, I, I could have gone further, like back into history. But I think it wasn't really as necessary. Uh, but that is the, the the gist of it. Okay, this is the correct website, um, but it's not giving me exactly what I'm looking for. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is it. So I'm gonna play you uh, one of these pieces. There. Okay, let's try this one. Amaru me mola virago, ya ya oye. Amaru me mola virago, ya ya oye. Amaru me mwe oye. Amaru me mola virago mi tegeta. Okay, they're, they're usually short. Uh, my internet yeah. is up to now. But I think that I should try and buy them. Listen to this reading. My other brothers. Do you hear that Sakala Brothers influence? Yeah, 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 yeah. The internet is slow, but it's loading, but it, it will play. You hear what what I meant by, uh, for example, the Sakala brothers being influenced by these rhythms.
internet is letting me down. Imagine writing a piece of music that is inspired by that. Wow. I'm telling you. Do you hear the Sakala brothers in this music? Yeah. Angela Nirenda, Sakala, they are there. Yeah, Angela Nirenda. Exactly. Let me play one more uh, from the east and then I'll jump to northwestern so you can hear the richness. This music was actually recorded. It was recorded in the back in the forties and fifties, some sometimes in the thirties. Okay. Yeah. So I'm switching on to Lunda now. To oh yeah. The richness of the rhythms that are uh, available. The internet is super slow today. Do you hear those harmonies? Very, <laughs> very informed by the traditional harmonies. You know? Yeah. Into that, just that. Do you hear that? You you can almost lose the beat, eh? There is a yeah, 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 yeah. If you're not listening well, you will lose it. But just the creativity that they, these people transferred from the drums onto the guitar, there's not much else hap happening, but there's that Kamkakashi thing. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -ba -ba -ba. So it's, ba -ba -ba -ba. it's kind of a slow. So you then build uh, your music around these rhythms. What, what kind would, you know, what, ish, I can't even think. Let me mm. songs and dances from the Lunda. Let's do yeah again. You Tracy, you see if you look at the screen, you see it says you Tracy. Nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a resource. I think I'm going to go ahead and pay so that I can access these and download them and then you know use them for research or to create new music. But this is the richness yeah. of music, you know. Like here, it was still raw. It was still you still get the traditional. You still get the small urban influence. Yes, but you still get the realness, the rawness of uh, of the music. 
you know. Okay, let me see if I can get a more traditional feel. Um, well, so your, your question was, what is Zambian music? Zambian music, it's, it's hard to define. It's like jazz, it's like uh, whatever, but we need to stamp our own identity into our music. Yes. Right. What I usually do is there are aspects of, of the music that I infuse into my compositions. For example, it could be the harmonies that I use. It could be the scale that I use. It could be the rhythms that I use. It could be uh, the so many parts of the, the textures, you know, that I use. Uh, let me see which one has. Drums, hopefully. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, internet. Yo, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You hear that, eh? Yeah. It's very Mbunda like, very Nkoya like music. That is not the pure Lozi one, you know. Let me play this other one here. But yeah, you, you can hear um, what is happening in the in the music, the melody there, they're very the scale they use, you know, the rhythms and uh, um, all, all those things that uh, make the music what it is. That is what Zambian music is. Let me see if I can find something called Makotemba. We can do Tonga. Let's do Tonga to oh, yeah. uh, give you a bit of variety. Then, you know, um, I made a controversial statement that our music is not influenced by our intellect. This is what I meant because we are not looking at where we've been and how we move into the future from there because scholars, thinkers are not really, you know. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say, okay, again, a controversial statement. The people <laughs> who are running the universities, Unza, Chalimbana, wherever music is, even now there's a Copper Belt University, they're not really qualified because I've met them on several platforms and trying to have these discussions, it doesn't work. Like, Two years ago, we had a conference in the Seychelles where I was I was advocating for the inclusion of African music in music education. And the yeah, very, yeah. are the ones who were against me, you know, were against my actually, in that agenda. Actually, it's, it's because of uh, that same point that you've raised. That's why I'm having this research, because it's a discussion that uh, 
we've been having with my lecturer for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's just so sad that my lecturer is not Zambian, he's South African. It took a South African to come into Zambia and say, no, but hey, this and this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the big names, I, I can tell you names right now. There used to be, okay, they've, they've passed on their names. I, I even, uh, they, they were doctors, they, were, they had PhDs, but I sat with them and tried to have a discussion to say, where is our music? What are we doing? You know, have we notated this music? Have we done this? The only person that I respect personally is John Mwesa. Yeah. John Mwesa. You know, he's, he created a system of using words. You know how, like, if you're teaching uh, music to uh, notation to young kids, what I do is like um, a crotchet. I call that an ant. I would draw it and say to the kids, this is an ant. Quavers, you know, the beamed ones, I'll say this is beetle. Then there are those uh, two semi-quavers and a quaver. I would call that yeah. uh, no, that would be butterfly. If it's the opposite quaver plus two semi-quavers, it would be grasshopper. Four semi-quavers would be caterpillar, and you're doing it in time, so it would be caterpillar, caterpillar, grass, beetle, ant, ant, beetle, ant. It's based on that, right? So those yeah. uh, uh, rhythms become internalized. John Wesa formulated his own system of teaching those rhythms. Actually, when, when, you, when you learn uh, to play our drums traditionally, uh, they will tell you a word like, uh, if you're playing semi-quavers, they'll say it's machicated, that one is machicated, you know? Then you know what to do because there, there's, uh, I think the word is anomanopaic words words which sound like what they describe. For example, a cuckoo bird is called a cuckoo bird because the cuckoo actually sounds like cuckoo, cuckoo, right? So you borrow that yeah. and use that to teach music, right? Um, in my push for the inclusion of African music, I'm all for world music and so on, but why should African music take the, the back bench? It shouldn't because they, yeah richness that we offer to the world you know the i'm planning to do my masters i haven't done my masters and i wanted in to do it in ethnomusicology because wow. Wow. you know of music it could be folk music it could be uh there's actually a movement now of which i am a part which is uh, uh composers of african descent and uh, yes. their music, you know, uh, mostly it started by uh, my American friend, uh, Dr. Nyaho. There's uh, another guy, uh, Fredo, he's uh, also a professor. Um, they are very pushing that agenda of African composers or composers who are in the diaspora, but of African descent. So it's our music, it's our way of interpreting our music through Western instruments, which is what I was, uh, the big debate is what is Zambian music? What is African music? Does that mean that we do not move our music forward? No, it doesn't. You know, there, there is uh, this music that is here. Uh, that you hear that richness?
Angule ibi mbolo mfula amula nge kuchulu kwa yu matu ya ndako mbira. Angula bamo. Tulila menda, tulila wayoba. Tulila menda, tulila harmonies the faults and, and so on you know so South Africa has done quite a lot more than we have uh, in terms of uh, recognizing African or their own traditional musics yeah they are using it you can go to university and study dance traditional dance uh, you can do a thesis in African music they they, they they are making strides like I myself have always included African music in in, uh, in my teaching into primary or in secondary school because there are certain things that I grew up doing for example sitting in the circle in the evening every evening and we are playing rhythm games uh, singing it's uh, that social music you know and how that formed and shaped my musicality, right? And I take that and transfer it into the classroom as I am sitting in a circle, playing rhythm games, you know. There's that flow, chili go, 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 chili fire, chili go, 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 chili fire. The kids are sitting in a circle, they have a stone in front, right? And they are passing the stones. Yeah. Chili go, 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 chili fire, chili go, 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 chili fire. And it keeps going, increasing in tempo, right? That is building a sense of rhythm. You know, they'll find their own niche. Eventually, they go past the go, 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 chili, go, go, go. Then somebody will miss it. Then they start again slowly. You know, that is a sense of rhythm, right? Clapping different uh, patterns and all this and all that. You know, singing and harmonizing. You know how our. I, I remember working in Kenya uh, with a church choir. And you are teaching them the soprano, right? You are standing with the soprano. Somebody is teaching the altos, right? The altos would not hear what the alto guy is teaching them. They would somehow hear what the soprano guy is teaching the sopranos and harmonize that soprano in fourths or thirds or sixths, right? <laughs> Them, the notated silent or be silent or whatever, nothing. Whoa. <laughs> so somebody would see that as okay, they are not smart enough. No, to me, it's not about that. It's that they are hearing a person who is a distance away and harmonizing that person, right? Yeah, the difficulty was in singing a note for them. They would go, La, and they would harmonize what they would hear in their head is. La, because they know they're supposed to sing lower. That is smart, that is intellectual, you know, stuff right there. So, um, in terms of where we've been, this, I'm going to uh, put this into the charts as well. Copy this particular website so you can explore. The, the snippets are short, right? The samples are about one minute each but you can then get an idea of what it is. And you, Tracy, I think he recorded music from all over Zambia. If you go into that, uh, oh, yes, yes. Um, this, this is called the Library of African Music, I think it's uh, International Library of African Music, yeah, Elam. They, they really recorded a whole lot of uh, things that are, raw information for us, you know, for us to draw, yeah. to inform what our Zambian music is. It's a pity I'm using a new laptop, uh, so I, <laughs> I can't play my music for you because it's in my old laptop, which I left at the school. Oh, but, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, so I can send you some music and or just even tag you to some videos that I have done uh, 
that uh, are of popular music, but my arrangements of it. And basically what I was doing is um, keeping some of the original, adding something new, um, just doing different things to, to the music, you know, to, to bring it to another light. It's like uh, there's a piece I wrote for Clark called Munaki. I'm sure you saw that uh, performance uh, online last year. Yes, I, I followed it. I followed it. Yes. The, I can tell you that the, the reason I wrote that piece for Clark was uh, one, he asked me to say, we don't have our own classical music you know, which we can call yeah. out. So I wrote that particular piece for him. And uh, I've written a few others for him as well, which haven't uh, yet been performed, but uh, the music is there. We're just waiting for the time. So um, the reason was one, here is a very skilled musician, right? But he does not have Zambian repertoire of music. So I was writing it from two points, one, was his skills level to to bring out Zambian-ness in the music. The melody was Zambian, uh, to also infuse it with a bit of uh, Western classical and so on. You know, and write the music in such a way that the local person and Lynch Clark, it was kind of challenging for him, you know, to actually uh, play through it. He was like, oh, this is difficult, but I'll make it, you know. And uh, <laughs> that uh, genre of music as in classical, Western Zambian classical music, Zambian Western classical music, right? Um, in yeah. terms of uh, where we're going with the music, um, we, we should exchange numbers. I'll send you one or two pieces that have been projects of mine with uh, Maureen Lander, because I've been talking about this with her to say, in a music, it doesn't color influenced. The music should be influenced by ours. So, wrote a few pieces, gave a few ideas, then she went back into the studio, found some musicians and worked on some stuff that I will send to you if you give me your WhatsApp number. Then I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. And listen to how it is played on Western instruments. The rhythms are Zambian, the harmonies are Zambian, okay. and so on, you know. So again, very long way to answer, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's where I am. Well, I think it, it even. Uh, I think before I, it brings me to my two last, two last points. Um, yeah, my first question being, where we have reached now, what's the possibility of us going back to our home? Uh, say that again, I missed that. Uh, where we've reached now, right? what, what, what are the possibilities of us going back to our roots and us regaining that Zambian unit? Okay, I'll try and be brief for this one. The possibilities are very vast. It's, it's, uh, it's one of my, uh, my missions, actually. Uh, one of my, the things that uh, inspire me to be creative, uh, inspire me to research is how we can go back to our roots. Um, because look, in the world we've taken full circle, we went ahead and embraced eating Western food, this and doing that. You know, we looked at our own traditional ways of building houses as a cake, but actually yeah. a round house is stronger than a square house, right? The way we build our, our houses traditionally is very sustainable. We don't need cement. Cement messes up the environment. The way we do, we create a mud or straw and what, what. And the world is making a full circle back to the roots, isn't it? 
I mean, when I come back to Zambia eventually, I'm I'm not going to really live in Lusaka. I'm, I'm going to live on a farm, maybe 60, 70 kilometers away. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to it's going to be sustainable, you know. It's going to be uh, more back to the roots, like eating real foods. I don't want to eat processed foods. I live in a city <laughs> processed foods, right? Going back to the roots is what we need to do, right? I mean, what does it help me to eat KFC? It just adds cholesterol. Yeah, but. If I go back and eat my village chicken, which is just boiled, no cooking oil, no what, just boiled, it's healthier, you know, than whatever. So even our music, our culture, our identity goes back to us being proud of who we are, right? You know, we've heard of uh, Black Lives Matter and identity and so on. Uh, history has been badly influenced by the West, now by the Chinese, in that yeah. we have been categorized as second class, right? Mm -hmm. Which should not be uh, the case. We are people in our own right, uh, our civilizations, like here, I live in the Sudan, and there are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt. There are temples here in Sudan, you know, uh, to the gods, the different gods, Ra, and so on that date back 3,500 years. You know, you step into these places and you're like, standing oh, all of uh, of uh, the the majesty of, of what you know what is there, what our cultures were. You know, like uh, I read a book by a French missionary who arrived in uh, Barcelona somewhere in the 1750s. And what he described was a civilization, you know. We had irrigation was there, animal husbandry was there. We had ministers of forestry, minister of animals, minister of what? In that book, it was in the space of the university was in what so already in the 1700s, we were civilized as a people. But we were made to feel that what is ours is second class or, or whatever, which is a So one or two people, I played the piano to accompany what he was doing. So we just did a short, like a medley of uh, his music, my music, because I, I'm both, but I'm more westernized because of my education and so on. But we fused, we fused them. Right now, um, there's a gentleman who is from Burkina Faso. Uh, he plays a instrument called the Gone. It's kind of like a chora. It's an amazing instrument. It's tuned to percussion, I mean, to a pentatonic. And uh, I will send you some of the samples of stuff that uh, um, we were doing like last night. We just, we just meet and we improvise, but I'm going to record uh, his music and record albums, you know, that celebrate our music. So it's us to, to bring it more and more particularly as the intellectual people. Um, I don't worry about uh, popular musicians. <laughs> right. Let them do what they do, but I think we should document. So important is documentation. I just showed you, shared with you, you, Tracy, and his library. Yeah. 
That is really good because unfortunately, if we go to the villages now, we'll find that the old traditions are dying away because of modernization, right? So what guys like Hugh Tracy did and others, Ali Kinkat also used to do that, you know, uh, and others, we need to collect that and document it properly and study. That's why I want to study ethnomusicology. Uh, for my and then not only document, then create new music influenced by what we just heard. You know, the, the traditional things, right? Keep some of it raw, you know? Keep some of it as it is. Go out there meet folk musicians. If South Africa celebrates their own folk musicians more than we do. Zimbabwe as well, Botswana as well. They, they have a space, they, they have support, you know, um, of, uh, okay, now it's fading, but they, there's, there are platforms that can be created. So my thinking is okay, documentation, right? Uh, research, creating platforms for the celebration of our own musics. Teach music to, in our schools, teach our music. Because all our kids are listening to is. Uh, our kids are not listening to Piki Piki Na Piki Doli. Piki Piki Na Piki Doli. Nakasanga Na Piki Doli. One, two, three, four, five, eleven, twelve. They are singing, row, row, row the boat gently down the stream. Merrily, that's what they are learning, right? Yeah. Me as a teacher, because I'm a global person, I will teach my 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 uh, six year olds. I'll teach them row your boat. I'll teach them piggy picking. I'll teach them. When you come into my classroom, it doesn't matter where I am. I'll teach. So all over the world, I'm enjoying that because I Now, rhythmically and what what it, it's not the same as Chule Mumanzi. It's not the same. Hugging in water, hey, doesn't breathe. It's not the same, but the kids will understand what you're singing about. The rhythms are the same. The lyrics are slightly different. That's what I do. That's what I, we, we must teach our children. We must celebrate our music currently. We must also create new music that is influenced by our own traditional music. We must create those. The important thing is those platforms. And one of them that we created with Clark and is the amazing music festival. This amazing music festival just celebrates music of African origin, whether it's classical or jazz or folk. That's what the platform is created for. And, uh, uh, we will be doing talks like I think this month is February, and so on. But that's what we need. We need to move in that direction. Um, our friends in the West keep practicing their traditions, they celebrate. They still celebrate. All we need to do is demystify, maybe refine. Let me tell you what I mean. My dad uh, did a few changes to tradition, right? So when a girl comes of age, they usually nowadays they're 11, 12, 13, right? When a girl comes of, on, of age, traditionally they'll take them into the house and teach them whatever they teach them. Um, 
and that changed that. So when you, you, you go into the house, my sisters went into, into the house, they were taught what was necessary for that stage of where they were, right? Hygiene, cooking, what, what. The bedroom issues, they know. Let's not teach them well. Go teach them at the kitchen party. Just before a woman gets married, they get into the house for that one month. That's when we teach them. Because it's not necessary for them to learn those things at age 13. They're children, mm -hmm. right? So my dad refined our tradition to work better. That's why I'm talking about refining our uh, understanding because there, there's a platform, a, a church platform, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're on it, uh, music leaders, not music leaders or something like that, you know, where... Yeah, I'm, I'm on it. And yeah. uh, last time I, I had asked a question that no one responded. Yes. It was... <laughs> you know, I, 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 I kind of stopped responding because... <laughs> Those people are so narrow-minded, I'm sorry to say. They're so narrow-minded. There was, there was that debate about scale, you know? No, we can't do scale. This is demonic. What, what? Ah, what rubbish is that? You know? Exactly. No. Do and they know that some of these... That, yeah? Go ahead. That, that debate is actually what prompted me to ask. I'm, I'm sure you saw something of... Uh, something like a person asking to say, do we have philosophy, philosophy that guide the kind of music that we're supposed to do in church? Yes. Exactly. It was because of that debate they were having. And there's nothing. You know, um, there are pieces of music that we sing in the church. That is pure pagan music. When you research where the song comes from, it's pure pagan. They used to do it when they were burning people in rituals. Yeah. yeah. And then you come and tell me that that music is better than my music of spell. No, we're not going to dance. You know? Like people, but the Bible says clearly in the book of Psalms that David danced. Yeah. Right? Dance is part of it. You know, you, you that's why we don't develop that's why our music is dying because people are saying we cannot. I remember a while back um, sharing a link of uh, a volley, the same guy who is uh, the indigenous musician. I'll send you the link as well. Um, volley performing an indigenous uh, Eddie Thomas gospel. And I'm getting goosebumps now because it is traditional, but it's rich in harmony, in devotion, in God. Tradition, yes. Who is to, to tell us that we can't worship God with dancing, with the spell piece or whatever, you know? That is <laughs> development. Right? Because we've set ourselves these walls to say church music is here. Yeah. Because we believe that our, our own traditions are, are not from God. You know, my as you progress in life, you will begin to question a lot of things. One thing I do not question is God's judgment. I cannot judge a person. It's between them and God. As yeah. in, there are, I live in a Muslim country, right? There is a mosque this side, there is three mosques this side, mosque this side. five times a day. There's a call to prayer. They pray. When I go down in, from my apartment, just here, downstairs, right, from, from my apartment, out in the open, 5 a.m., group of Muslim men, they put prayer mat, just in the street, prayer mat in the street, 5 a.m., now I'm going to run, then they're going to pray. Five times a day, they'll gather there to pray. Do you think God really knows those prayers? Do you think 
God really knows the point somewhere who does not know which God is praying for, is talking to the God. Do you think God really minds to answer that prayer or not? No. Let God do his godness, you know. As we've chosen to yeah. be apostolics and enjoy our lives as new apostolics and do what we do, it doesn't give us a right to judge other people or to say this or what. No, it doesn't. Right? We have chosen this path. But others have different paths to, to us. And it's up to God. It's God who will ultimately do his God thing and say, okay, you after all, doesn't the Bible say everybody will be judged according to their deeds, good or bad? Yeah. It doesn't say whether you're Christian or not. It doesn't. Simply put, good or bad. Good, decide bad. That's what the Bible says, right? Yes, there's baptism, there's this, there's that, but that part of whether people enter heaven or not, me, I don't, I don't enter that debate. It's the same as music, you know, for, for you to tell me that my, my grandfather, his music is evil. I refuse. His music is not evil. Your music also, you know, Songs, all of your songs as Western boy, influenced by other things. Yeah. Right. And, and so those are stuff I was thinking of which which um, actually a song was sung last Sunday by those Cape Town guys. It was one of the songs that uh, it's actually a folk song. But oh. it was, yes. One of them, I'll, I'll, I'll check the, the service and then I'll point you to where, where, you, where that's going As a folk song, but the church has taken it up and put right? <laughs> Still music. Uh, we, we also need to, I think the biggest thing we need to do is uh, change our mindset. My friends in South Africa, they colonize our mind and democratize our mind. That's what my friends usually say. And so we need to I don't, I don't have to educate mindset uh, and embrace our mind, celebrate it. So those five points I think I talked about Documenting, uh, research, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, the last one, the last point that I had is actually more of um, a request on two different platforms. Yeah, so with with this study, there has been we're trying to attempt in creating an archive of local music composed by our local composer and a library that would always be part of oh, okay. you had this and so on. So it's actually a request if if, if it's possible you can share some of your local composition then we can we can get to work of course. I know I have a link, a link through you, where I can know multiple composers that are from Zambia and then we try to contact them and see if they are willing to be part of, of that. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, there, there is, uh, I would need to, okay, a lot of my stuff that I did, that research is back in Zambia, so. Uh, I would need to have access to it, but what I have, I will, I will share with you. Um, there's a group also on WhatsApp sharing music. Or what. Um, I love that uh, group, and that's also part of how I collect uh, music. I just people when people are done sending, sharing, I just put them aside. The the thing that needs to 
de vino you mention the the police right. how do we mean a local tradition is it a tradition or is it of the library of traditional local whatever I think you should go ahead I will definitely support whatever whatever we you know we can um, and I, I do not uh, if somebody composes a message it is still fine it's just that then we have to then judge or not judge judge is strong we have to categorize that music under Western rules. Now, yeah. let me point something out to you. Um, having worked in Botswana and South Africa, there is a very strong choral tradition, uh, which is not based, but it's actually based on South Africa, where Stone serenaders or something like that. So, um, have those pockets, and they do come together, you know, and uh, compete against each other, or think they do constellations, or so and they are influenced both by African and Western music. So I have been an accompanist to those. I have been uh, an adjudicator uh, for those competitions. And the Western tradition, it's equal to, uh, to adjudicate it because they, they have, they write down their music with instruction on how it should perform, allegro, tempo, staccato, uh, legato, macato. So it's easier to, to adjudicate a piece of Western music, right? Yeah. Because I understand the context, I understand the notation, I understand this and that, right? Our African music is a little bit more difficult because one, the traditions are different, right? Some cultures slide in their music. Some cultures dance in their music. Some cultures do this, do that, right? So how do you then adjudicate? So you do have, uh, especially in South Africa, composers who compose their traditional music, influenced by the culture. But how do they adjudicate? So I was pushing for the composer to give us notes on performance. Right. Okay. Still, I'm looking at the rhythms. Are they still rhythms that the choir is singing? I'm listening to harmonies. I'm listening to the style of singing. You heard the tonga singing here, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You heard the Ruvale singing. So if the choir is singing a Ruvale piece and they are singing it like they're singing Mozart, to me it's a fail. Right? You are fail, right? If I'm singing yeah. the traditional piece, my voice should not be refined, it should be raw, you know? That's what Oliver Mkikuji told us when uh, we performed with him. I performed with Oliver Mkikuji several times. The first time was in Zambia, I think, 1995. Then uh, Botswana, I met him multiple times in a closed setting, you know, where he meets musicians and you find yourself there. 
and uh, I asked him to say, but why did you not refine your voice? You know, he said, my voice is my identity. This is how singing my Shona music, that's how we sing it. We don't sing it like Michael Jackson sings his music. He has had different influences. I have had my influence. So when we sing our traditional music, we should have pointed, you know, uh, do, do we do glissandos? Do we do, what do we do? You know, are we going to accompany our music with piano? And if so, what kind of accompaniment are we going to do? Are we going to let the piano play the role of Yasilimba? Or play that role of being the drama? You know, there's a piano the style of play invented by a friend of mine called uh, Dramistic Piano. Is a uh, is uh, the guy is uh, Nigerian, right? It's a particular style. When you hear it, you hear it. It's, it's like a drums, you know, that are playing, right? And so on. So we then need, that's why I was talking about uh, researching about music. Values, how do they produce their voice? What rhythms do they use? And what scale do they use? such that when a choir or a composer brings out that music, it's Luvali influenced or Tonga influenced or Goni or Nsenga or Chewa or Bemba influenced, what are the characteristics of that particular ethnic group's music, right? And then after that, we can document it in the library so that when you bring a piece of music, it's not just a piece of music, whether it's notated or recorded, there are notes on performance. We call them performance notes. So I would insist when I was adjudicating to say, no, is a composer of this piece still alive? They'll say, yes, okay. When I speak to them, yes. So I'll call them and interview them. It's okay, so when you're composing this piece, what were you thinking? And then they will talk about this, my influence was this, that. Okay, this is what I was trying to bring out. And you're like, oh, okay. So when I'm judging or adjudicating the piece, and then of that, mind frame to say, okay, this is what to expect. If they don't do it, then they have failed to execute that particular style of movie. So as, as uh, you move into documenting, into creating archives, your, the compositions that you do, if the composer is still alive, let them write about what their influences are. Let them write uh, a little outline to say, okay, this is why I composed these things. This was going on in my life. And as a result, I wrote it. This, it sounds sad or it sounds happy because I was celebrating and this and that. Because even in, whether in Western, because Western has been studied, right? When you study by book, certain scales, certain intervals, you know, they mean something in particular, right? Um, Hallelujah chorus, hallelujah. It's shouting, hallelujah. You don't shout when you're happy, you don't shout, hallelujah. It's ha, that's why it's a high note, right? It's hallelujah. Yes, I'm happy. You know what I mean, yeah? You're not going to say, yeah. I'm happy. No, no. that's why it is not as a high note, right? But within range, so it's, Really, when you think about it, if you take away the notes when Hallelujah Chorus is playing, it's Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. You know, if you think, take away the notes, you should hear the spoken because speech, singing is glorified speech. So, if you take away the music notation, you should still feel the driving force behind the music as this or as that, you know? So when you, you have our own composers, that's what we need to be taking for, to say, okay, what was he trying to do, right? In which style was he writing? And so on and so forth. So I'm very willing to assist, and, you know. So I'll give you what resources I have as well. Yeah, then my, my, my last point is um, I remember on, on our first chat, I mentioned something to you today. 
I look forward to a time where I might be able to play some of your music. Um, and today I would love to make a request. Um, I've been, I think since last year, I've been participating in the Pichoso uh, classical competition. Um, they are held in Zambia. I think Theo is the one, Theo Bird is the one uh, that we are able to go. The whole competition. The yes, the Victor song. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I happened to participate last last year and I, I won in the piano category. But then my, my choice of repertoire. <laughs> I, I remember I saw it. Congratulations. I think we say congratulations also. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but then I'm more particular with my choice of repertoire. Um, as I mentioned last time, so I've taken keen interest in African music. That, that, that's one thing that brings me closer to who I am. I feel more happy when I perform something like African originality. Uh, so the last time I did a piece by uh, Florence Bright, she's, she's, she's part of um, the program that I, I think I heard some recordings by Dr. Nyaho, yeah. uh, African Piyaki. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been doing that project. I'm actually working on doing more performances from his volume because he has written some volumes of piano from, that, from volume one to volume five. I have all the volumes. But then in this year's, uh, this year's competition, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something new. Uh, it, it's possible I could have something that has a Zambian touch because, of course, I'm supposed to play something from Baroque or classical, and then the other one is my choice. So, for my choice, I would really, really love to bring out something that's new to the market. I've never heard of it. Zambian. Yeah, definitely. I have some. Uh that I can send in your direction. Uh, Nyaho, Dr. Nyaho is a very good friend of mine where we met in the Seychelles. So we are on the same team, you know, of uh, pushing for African uh, music and influenced by uh, composed by Africans. That's exactly what I was talking about. So we must compose, create music that is influenced by, by us. So definitely I'll send some music in your direction. Once I get my other laptop, uh, well, I just need to transfer the data from that one to, to this new one, because the school gave us uh, different laptops. So I had to in that one, but they've saved the data. So once I get that data, I'll, I'll send that for you. I mean, um, this is something, uh, my push in at that conference two years ago was for African music. And then I met Nyaho and Fredo, who were pushing piano music of uh, uh, the diaspora or African diaspora. So it was a, a natural marriage, so to speak, a natural uh, friendship that came together. And last year, actually, uh, during lockdown, uh, the first wave of Corona, I did a lot of, uh, I say to myself, okay, I'm going to use this time to create music. To, uh, you know, just come out of the thing, nothing, but come out with uh, quite a number of uh, compositions and work, all sorts of things. So, uh, definitely I'll send your music. Um, I'll read it to yeah, It will be tricky. Calling with them and so on, but I know you do. <laughs> well, at least I still, I still have. I think I have about three, three months to prepare for the competition, so <laughs> I really work hard. Yeah, yeah, and then I can, I can, I will also definitely give the, give you uh, performance notes of why I wrote it in a particular way and. Um, you see, that's that's how also our music develops, right? Um, I have been influenced by my Zambian music, so what I'm hearing is maybe a CD, 
it. So what simba? I'm now bringing it into the piano. You know, having that uh, simba in the piano, there are certain ways to bring out that through how you play, how you pedal, how you your phrasing and all that, right? Uh, your technique, your is it wrists that you're going to be using or whatever? And I'll tell you to say, okay, this is supposed to be the maom, this low note is maom, and then you're doing something else. And maybe I'm, I'm just adding a melodic line to that, so I might go. And then I whatever the harmonies are there, you know, it's those kinds of things. And I would describe the music to say, I would even put in a recording to say, okay, this influenced that, this influenced that. But you are clear, you know, with, uh, with exactly what you're doing. So, yeah, definitely, I I, I am honored actually that you you request me to, to do this. Now, the one who's, who's on it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is a great time. Great talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to more. Uh, yeah. I hope I hope doors are always open. <laughs> yes, actually, I, I'm just thinking to myself that uh, with that platform that we've created, is amazing. It's a perfect pl platform for us to uh, to bring out these issues that we we have discussed. You know. So, I might do a Zoom based chat, you know, and invite people to a chat like what we've had. And maybe have one on uh, Facebook as well. And uh, just to, so we can inform ourselves, you know, and uh, move in the right direction. So, thank you very much. Now, this I've been recording, so I will send you. Uh, the recording. I think I'll I'll, I'll 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 just give you a link. I'll save it on a, on a cloud, and then you can just download the, the link. Okay, I'll, I'll really really appreciate that. Awesome. And also, well, I thank you very much. Yeah, I'll need to do some more research, you know, because it's been sitting. <laughs> it's <pleasure. laughs> there you go. All right, so have a good night. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Bye.